It's National Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week, and SOS, the Share Ourselves nonprofit organization in Costa Mesa, is shedding light on the subject by hosting their first annual Sleep Out on Superior event. Community members are invited to actually sleep outside and replicate what it's like to be homeless. Let's see what change this brings about in Orange County. Welcome to SOS and you're in the main lobby of SOS and this is our social services division here. And the social services division is that unique setting that allows people to have uh, direct access every day, Monday through Friday. And they can receive food here, get financial aid, case management assistance, resources and referrals. There's tax days here, we have a legal law clinic here. I really have to describe this as the heart and soul of SOS because it reflects what's so common to our everyday lives. And for the people who come to SOS uh, who are struggling, marginalized, uh, sometimes in a catastrophic condition, this is a safety net for them. It's a place to come and find the safety net. Right over here you'll see that we really believe in our values and so our four core um, our four core um, values are there, dignity, service, excellence, and justice. And each one of those are key to our um, mission statement in that we really believe that you respect, you have compassionate care, that mercy and justice are principles that we believe in. So we're very much advocates for systemic change, that we uh, believe in excellence, that all people deserve service that's excellent, delivered with excellence, delivered by people who care, and non-judgmental. We're not here to judge you, we are here to serve you. So lots of SAC activity goes on here. You can see tonight a little bit of the activity going on here. Special program tonight because we're a center for care for the homeless and we're really trying to be in solidarity with them this evening. Volunteers. Volunteers is a core value of SOS. So this side of the operation, which is social services, 90% of every service that's delivered here is done by a volunteer. So volunteers um, interact with people and they provide for their most essential care. So we're gonna walk along here and <clears throat> this is exactly how a client would proceed. They'll come through the doors and there will be an, um, they will meet with someone. <clears throat> we have simple services like a mailbox here. People have no idea how difficult it is if you can't afford a P.O. box. And if you're looking for a job and you don't have a street address, your resume probably gets thrown out before you even start. This is a protection for the homeless as well because a lot of their mail, they do keep in touch with their families even though they may be disconnected from them. And that's a way for them to get their mail and to be protected and get what they need. Case management is here. Case management is that incredible opportunity when a catastrophic condition has come into your home, a mother's diagnosed with cancer, the family is now um, not able to function well. We have chefs that will cook meals for families. We've had chefs that have cooked meals for a whole month for families while the mother's going through some therapeutic um, care for a cancer condition. So case management is really important. It navigates you through the difficult times. So our, our families will come there <clears throat> and then they will come back here and this is our classroom and this is where the volunteers sit and they sit in here and this is where they talk to people, they engage with them, they um, 
find out what the problem is, do their best to solve it. On top of that, we are um, a part of the Covered California Network, so we do all eligibility enrollment for all the insurance plans, and we do all that free. We do all these services free of charge. We have, we're walking back to the kitchen, and the kitchen is um, a vital part of our operation. The food that's collected here is picked up by uh, volunteer drivers on the road, <clears throat> and they go out five days a week and pick up food. We have donated food that comes in to us. We also have, um, we purchase food. We purchase supplies for all of this based on our donated funds. So you can see tonight we're preparing for the Thanksgiving holiday, which is for the three days before Christmas, has the largest number of people are trying to come in for food. So we're getting fresh produce prepared tonight. We have chickens. We make sure that everybody gets at least two chickens if they don't get a turkey. So you can see this is the volunteers actively preparing for the Thanksgiving holiday in our kitchen. And this goes on five days a week with people preparing food here. <clears throat> we collect food from restaurants, from grocery stores, from the Costco's, from the Mother's, from Trader Joe's, from all these stores, and it come in here and the volunteers glean it and repack it. So um, I would dare say you would buy that bag of produce if you went to the store. So it's a beautiful bag of produce. This is um, where the distribution happens. I was going to show you our, this is uh, really um, pretty um, crazy in here. You can see they're bagging chickens in here right now. And they have to get them out of that in freezer that's there. This is what sets us aside as a, um, as a food bank because we have this incredible food freezer and cooler and it was donated by Colpac to us in about 1994. So we've been able to deliver appropriate food when people need it can't have a health clinic and uh, just hand out pastry and sweets. So this is the distribution site. Every day, Monday through Friday, volunteers pack food. They pack the food based on what the people need. <clears throat> These are all pre-packed for Thanksgiving. And, um, and we do many of the bags that you see on the shelves right now have been donated. Cardin Hall is a school, Newport Harbor is a school. All of these schools, they rally the kids to get the food together and they bring it in here and we do it every single day. Homeless come every day and if you're a family or something, we ask you to try and come once a week so we can make sure we can take care of everything. But obviously we would never turn anyone away for food. So if you can think of it this way, the, it comes from behind here and this is your distribution point. This is a wonderful example too. Uh, we have assisted uh, military mothers who were the only Latino support group for Marines in the United States. And this um, flag was sent to us from Iraq and was signed by the soldiers in Iraq whose mothers we were supporting while they were here. We have, um, we have all of these items. That, yeah, I think this is very interesting. If you'll notice, we have cat food and dog food. Um, people have pets. Homeless particularly love to have their pet is their friend, and families have them. And a lot of people are really generous in their donation. This is all, everything here is donated items. Another really great example of getting children involved and, and actually learning that you can take care of others in a simple way are the birthday bags. So we ask families, your child's having a birthday, how would you prepare a bag for another family that would have a need of that. And I can tell you, every day, every day, five days a week, mothers come in here trying to find um, birthday cake, something that they can do for their children because they don't have the resources. The people who come here are very low income, some no income, very marginalized. Seniors, very vulnerable population of seniors. They're called the tea and toast diet. They make a decision to, um, to not eat so that they can use their funds to pay for their rent or to pay for their medications that's not covered. And in some cases, just simply to have a few dollars to buy a grandchild something. So we uh, provide for the seniors and they come in and get this. <clears throat> um, this is our boardroom. It is also used for the legal law clinic. We have um, public law in here two times a month. We also have a budgeting class here called Financially Fit. We realize that when people have 
uh, catastrophic conditions or they lose a job or somebody gets cut from full-time to part-time, they have to adjust what they have. So we have a partnership with Wells Fargo and we actually teach budgeting classes and you can have one-on-one -on -one counseling of how to adjust when this um, loss of income has happened. So I just sort of think of this as the human condition. It's the world we live in, and this is the safety net for those times when you just need that one little Band-Aid that might make all the difference in where you need to go. So this speaks to, uh, this speaks to all the work over here. And, and this, uh, this uh, poster, you, I mean this wall you see behind you, for example, the three children there in it, they actually were, oh, they actually were um, children that came here and they were getting Halloween costumes. And we had people donate their Halloween costumes because the children had grown them, and then we distributed them for the Halloween season. So, okay. We'll walk this way. <laughs> we have incredible support from the philanthropic, from the chefs in our county. We have about 24 of them that have supported us for years. As you saw tonight for our dinner tonight, we had two chefs come in and donate the food for the evening so that we could do this event with everyone. So we're leaving now and we're walking to the um, back side of our clinic and we're going to, we'll go in the back way and come out the front. This is the only time you could come in the back hall because you can't come in when patients are here. Uh, this is the back hall, provider rooms. This is where our the providers, we have um, three me medical doctors. We have five, six mid-levels, nurse practitioners and PAs. Um, so this is their area. This is our uh, psychologist. So we have a counseling very much on behavioral health. We believe that it's about the body, the mind, and the spirit. So our agency is integrated, and it's integrated to support the whole person. You'll see we come into the back hall. This probably looks pretty familiar to a lot of people. Um, but I think what people will be very surprised is the hygiene that we have here, how lovely everything is appointed. We really believe in the respect and dignity that people deserve to be treated in facilities that are respectful and worthy of the people who are coming to us. We're a comprehensive clinic. We, f we provide uh, full scope primary care. We treat people from pediatrics through geriatrics. We do, um, so we're the primary care doctor that you all visit and make sure that you stay well and healthy. We're into preventative health. We have supportive services for things, edu health education classes. This is our lab. Uh, next to it is our dispensary pharmacy, which is locked up because that's the law. But the really wonderful part about that is if somebody comes here, they don't leave here without their medication. Very different than you go to your doctor and you get the script and you have to go over to get it. When we, uh, we dispense here so that we treat, we assess and we treat, and we give them the ability to get well. You will um, see by... This, we have um, six exam rooms, and we have um, the dispensary. We do medication therapy management. We do med reconciliation. For people who take more, five or more medicines, the chances that they will probably have an adverse drug reaction, and so we manage those medications for them to assure that there is no adverse drug reaction. This is our dental clinic. I think you can see it's a beautiful facility. It's a four chair operation. We do full mouth restoration. So very often the people come to us have been untreated with any kind of oral health and we're able to provide and restore their mouth to a full healthy, um, a full healthy treatment. <laughs> uh, pardon? All your doctors, dentists, who pays their salaries? We do. <laughs> we, we do this via, we are a fundraising organization. We've had a 44-year history of donor-based relationships. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we, for 42 of those years, we, had, we were only supported by private donations, foundations, businesses. In the last two years, we've been designated a federally qualified health center. Simply means that we have a payer source now. So we can accept people on public programs. So if they have Medi-Cal, which is what across the country is called Medicare, or they have um, 
any of the public programs, we can now accept them in, and that allows us to have a payer source to, to reimburse us for services we do here. Now, these doctors are not retired. Oh, no, 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 no. These are fully practicing doctors and dentists. They are um, <laughs> very impressive ones. Uh, our me former medical director was a graduate of Stanford, and our current medical director is out of UCI. Uh, we have a nurse practitioner who's from Columbia University. We have a doctor who practiced his residency at Boston Medical Center. So um, very high caliber doctors. We are two of our dentists are graduates of Loma Linda Dentistry School. So this is the backside that most of you will never see in a dental clinic. But it's important to know that there's a clean lab and a dirty lab. And it's important to know that it's hygienic because all of this is a part of your well-being. So this is the backside. Um, I think you can see how much we appreciate keeping things well and nice. This is a pretty good example of um, doctors who have been um, volunteers to us. We do have a large network of doctors who do volunteer services for us. We manage the primary care and then they will do the specialty care. This is a good example. Dr. Claus, one of our leading endodontists in the county, did 20 years of service for us. So, and all of that was free service for us. He's also a velodrome bicycle rider. So, this is coming into the lobby, which is um, really, I think, extraordinarily beautiful. You can see it's well appointed. We have, it's colorful. It's, um, it's very soothing. You know, people, people go to the uh, health center and they're anxious, and so you want to put them in a soothing role. We greet people, we know their names, we know personal information about them, and we really respect them for when they come in here. So um, I'm very proud of all this because it takes a lot to make it like this. So it is those people in the community who support us, it is our donors. We have partnerships with Hogue Hospital, with St. Joseph's, with Children's Hospital of Orange, so we can have hospitalizations for patients. Um, it's a network. It is not one agency. It is the ability of our network who has a strong mission belief and treat those people most at risk. And we've created a network of care that's principled on the same beliefs that we have. When you come in here and you have to go to the back hall, it's usually, uh, this is our mission statement, by the way. So that we are servants who provide care and assistance to those in need and act as advocates for systemic change. That's a big statement because it means you have to be a risk taker. And SOS has been a risk taker for 44 years. We're risk takers for the people. Um, when you walk to the back hall, usually that's a boring trip. So we decided to put, make a word wall. And this word wall, our core values of ours in many of the languages that are spoken here. We are um, non-denominational. We are culturally appropriate. I think we speak almost nine languages here now. So. This word wall is kind of an expression of that. These are quotes from our patients um, that we put on the wall to just really reflect exactly how they feel. We get wonderful thank yous from everyone. And we get thank yous from our donors. And we get thank you from the community who became involved because they realize we're really making a better community. Because it's not about how well we do, it's about how well we all do. And that's what SOS represents, a caring, compassionate, resource for yeah. the community. So getting back to the politics, what do you say to people who say you're nothing more than a magnet for homelessness? <laughs> you generate problems more than you solve. Yeah, yeah. What do you say to I tell them I think we are a magnet, but we are a magnet for people dedicated to good. We are a magnet for people who believe in service, who believe that their communities are better because they care because they elevate those who have less just as they elevate those who have more. We are a magnet to teach young children that they have to live outside of themselves, that themselves are not the only world. And so, yeah, we're a magnet. I think we are a magnet for the, for the good of a community. So I don't argue against being a magnet. I think it's great. I think it's really important for people to understand how our health center functions. And our health center functions to serve those people who are 200% below federal poverty level meaning that they have a public program and we screen them for eligibility and they can participate how, and they can be engaged with our care. What's more important to know is that we do not turn anyone away based on their inability to pay. So if someone is in great need of care, we will care for them. And 
The other part is that if someone is above 200 percent below federal, above poverty level and they wanted to come here to avail themselves of our services because they don't, let's say for the dental clinic, you find out you need to have a whole mouth restoration and you don't have $5,000 to pay for that and you don't have dental insurance, then you would have the opportunity to utilize our services, but you would pay appropriate to what we could what you should pay for our cost. And it would be significantly less than others. Most importantly, we provide care for everyone. We do not turn people away. We are the vessel of the people. It's our responsibility to empty out our vessel so it can be refilled. Um, I need to apologize a little bit. About 30 years ago, myself and a good friend of mine were working a campaign for Karen McGlynn for city council. And she lost by just a little bit. And part of the reason was on the east side, there were some dogs that started chasing us. And we just started throwing them behind us, just running, <laughs> leaping fences, trying to get away. So there was probably about 12 votes that would have put her over the top. And, and, we would, and we would have had a very different city in Costa Mesa had I not been such a coward. So, but I am, I am entirely very sorry. Um, I am the executive director, chief uh, CEO of Mercy House. Um, I am its original employee. I've been there uh, going on, this is my 25th year, so a little over 24 years right now. Uh, um, two years prior to that, I worked at a local shelter here, the Orange Coast Interface Shelter. I was fired for insubordination, so there you go. Um, I'm sure that's a surprise to some of you, uh, or not so much. And I, and I have been extremely happy at Mercy House. Um, oh, we do a wide variety of things, everything from street outreach to homeless prevention programs to running several different types of shelters, as well as permanent housing programs. Uh, we're all throughout Orange County, um, San Bernardino County, as well as uh, Riverside County as well. We just had a groundbreaking ceremony last weekend in my old neighborhood for a, a veterans housing project. Uh, we shelter and house and serve about 5,000 people a year, you know, give or take, give or take funding levels. Um, tonight, I want to sp speak very briefly um, about some things in homelessness that might be contrary to what you might think. Um, um, and I want to suggest that, well, we all of us have our opinions of, of, of homelessness. And, and usually, they're just opinions. They're not based on any data. They're not based on any research. They're not based on anything but bias or personal ideology or because you talked to some homeless guy one time in your life, and now all of a sudden you're a sneaking expert. Um, we have children in the room. I just cleaned up my, my language right there. Um, um, and so what I want to suggest to us, though, is that a lot of the opinions that we have, a lot of what we've been taught is wrong. We, in fact, have been lied to. And we believe certain things about homelessness that just get beat into us over and over and over again, and we just take it as gospel fact. The problem is the data doesn't support it. In fact, the data supports a lot of things that are opposite. For example, and I'm guilty of this, it's what we knew in the 80s. When the homeless shelter movement first started, what we wanted to make sure that we did do is get people in the shelters right away and fix them, right? We wanted to make sure that we fixed every problem. Before we put you into housing, we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, um, any mental health concerns were addressed, that you were completely clean and sober, that you were working, that you were paying bills, etc. Otherwise, you weren't worthy of housing, was essentially the message. We didn't use that language, but that, wasn't, that was the net effect. So before that we would actually give someone housing, we had to make sure they weren't drinking or using drugs or in any way behaving dysfunctionally. Does anybody here think that there aren't alcoholics living in Newport Beach? <laughs> I know at least three Coke users just down the hill here in Superior that live in really nice houses in, in Newport Beach, and they're doing just fine. Sometimes you don't have to fix everything for a person to make sure that they're housed and they stay housed. It all depends on what it is that you want to accomplish. Another thing that we're taught Another thing that we're taught is that there really isn't any answer. That the answer is that um, um, this is just how it is. We're always going to have the homeless with us. We just have to accept it and do the best we can. We're going to talk about that in a minute. That just is not true. That simply is not true. We're also told, and you're about to get a bunch of mailers because it's the holiday season. This is when groups like mine make a lot of our money, right? 
<laughs> so you're going to start getting a lot of things in the mail that say, the problem has never been worse, please give. Again, we'll have to look at the data and see if that's in fact true. It's a great opinion, it's a great marketing tool, but it may not necessarily be true. So what do in fact, what does in fact the data tell us? Well, let's start with the numbers first off, right? For years and years and years and years, we have been we were told that there were 35,000 homeless people in Orange County. It's a number that just, it was like propaganda. And I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean that in the, the, the full definition of that, that there are 35,000 homeless. And we took it for, from people that were receiving services from the county and people in shelters, et cetera, and that just became the number. Actually, the number started lower, and we just assumed that it got worse every year. And so we just all repeated the same thing. We had absolutely nothing to verify it. That's what we said. And it's quoted in some of our literature. It got quoted in the press, and it became truth. Problem was, there was just nothing to back it. What do we really know about the numbers? Well, six years ago, when we adopted a best practice way to count, in fact, homeless folk, people that are there, the number that we came up with was a little over 21,000, actually. So we start that with a baseline. And there is a system of counting those who are homeless, enumerating the homeless that may like or dislike, but it is what's out there. And it at least is a consistent method, and it's done all across the country. So about six years ago, the number was 21,000. Then two years after that, anybody want to guess what the number was? Came down to 18. 18. Two years ago, after that, so two years from now, because we're about to do another count this coming January, the number was 12,700. 12,700. The numbers are getting lower and lower and lower. The notion that the numbers are expanding just isn't sustainable by the data. And I have this crazy bias that we ought to maybe follow research and data as opposed to just our own wild opinion. <laughs> it's just a thought. It works in other fields of study. It works in medicine, right? It works in, in, in business. It works in other places. Why not apply it to the social science as well? Why not let, let data drive our responses? What do we find in Costa Mesa? Now, it's, it's interesting. It's very, very interesting since we're here in Costa Mesa. And everybody has an idea of what the number is. And, and you'll hear, you'll, you'll talk to some folks in PD. You'll talk to individuals who live on the west side. You'll talk to other service providers. And they will swear up and down that there are four to 500 people who are homeless in, in Costa Mesa. And that, in fact, and this almost became part of the political campaign, that the problem is getting worse. And it's interesting how we come up with these numbers. Um, so about a year or two ago, there was a church group that was doing a feeding program out at Lions Park over here. And it was really interesting how we come to our numbers. And so I went up um, where, the, where, there, where the serving line was, and I stood there, and oh my god, there was just, as many, there was just, the, just the park was filled. I mean, as far as I could see, there were folks that were living out on the streets. It was unbelievable. And I thought to myself, my, there has to be two, 300 people here. Has to be. That's what I'm saying. And I mean, and people are busy. People are just, they're going at it. So I'm thinking, this is, this is huge. But I did something that was in interesting. I decided to leave the line, circle back, and take a different point of view. And I stood up on a hill that was slightly elevated so I, I could actually see the number and do a quick count. It's about 50. <laughs> My experience told me that it was so many more. But when you stop back and really measured it, it wasn't. It just wasn't. It wasn't that, it wasn't that many. And so when we say that there, there are four or 500 homeless people in, or in, in Costa Mesa, we're kind of just making that up. Because we have to talk about what our definitions are, right? Now, I and my family, we live in Costa Mesa, so I am not an outsider. I know that's what some of you might be thinking. I actually live here. I've lived here forever. Girls go to school here. I'm part of the community. Um, 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 and if you were to ask anybody, the, the number is huge. But how is my residency defined? Our residency is generally defined by where we generally sleep, right? Tonight, unless something really weird happens, I'm going to sleep in Costa Mesa tonight. That's, that's my home. That's, that's, that's where I live. And so if we use that as something of a definition in Costa Mesa, our number, about 120. 
And we've done the best research along with uh, Vanguard University, because I'm also uh, a, um, an adjunct faculty member there. Over the last five or six years, we've done the best counts, the most accurate counts that's ever been done in the entire county. And honestly, it's ranged from a low of about 108 to a high of about 125, with the numbers slightly going down over the last two years. Now, why is that important? Why do we want to talk about that, right? Because that tells us something. That tells us, one, that the problem isn't so big that we have to lose hope. When you hear crazy people like me, and, and I, I am a little off, when you hear guys like me say, we can end homelessness and end it pretty quickly, we can. We're not talking about something insurmountable. Don't lose hope. There is no reason to. Now, what some folks will say, what some folks will say is, yeah, you know what? Shelters and housing and programs work for people who are willing to invest in themselves, right? Um, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to try and show some class here and, and, and not name the group. But there's a group out there that says, or groups out there that say, we will help anybody who wants help. That's really just a very nice way of saying there's some people we're not going to help, <laughs> right? But most of us will say, if you're willing to work hard and be re responsible, housing will work. But not for those folks that are living out on the street, not for the folks that are sleeping in Lions Park tonight, right? Not for the folks that go to the lighthouse. Not for the folks that are you know, sleeping in the courtyards you know, up above, upstairs, kind of where, where, the, where the little uh, patio areas are. Because there's mental health issues and, and drug addiction issues and so forth, we can't just put them in housing. We have to deal with their behaviors first. Problem is no. Maybe. I'm not saying that services aren't important, but what I'm saying is they're not the first thing. The truth of the matter is, the magic is in the housing. The truth of the matter is, if you just simply get a lot of people housed, a lot of the behaviors that are so disturbing, that are so dis dysfunctional, that are so destructive, actually take care of themselves. There is something magical that happens when you get a person, even if they aren't perfect, even if the economics aren't perfect, if you get them housed, amazing things happen. Let me give you an example. One of our programs that we run is the Armory. And part of the Armory, uh, we, we developed a program called the Family Redirection Program back in 2008. And since 2008, we have taken 1,500 families off the streets in Orange County. All right, 1,500. Now, um, the first two years that we did it, there were 140 families that we took literally off the street and put into permanent housing. I was desperate. I was absolutely desperate because I couldn't get them in our shelters. And the reason I couldn't get them in our shelters was because, one, a lot of the shelters were full, but a lot of times shelters don't want to take people who aren't perfect, right? They don't want to take someone unless you can prove six months sobriety, unless you already have an income, and I'm not making this stuff up, unless you, um, in one case, already have a car, unless you already have a job. There's a running joke that about half my staff wouldn't qualify for some of these shelters, <laughs> and at least four board members wouldn't pass either. So I, I mean, at some point you begin to wonder who you're serving. And so since we couldn't get these families in these shelters, we did a Hail Mary. I told my staff, look, let's just let's put them in housing. Whatever we can do, by whatever means necessary. Let's take money out of our general fund. Let's, get, let's talk to some donors, and let's just place them in housing. We're not going to offer any services. We're going to walk away. It's not what I want to do, but I don't have a choice. Five years later, this is what we have found. Of those 140 families, what was predicted was they'd all come storming out back into the armory, back into the streets, back into our programs. After five years, 14. 14. Of those 14, five of the 14, uh, uh, when given a second chance, bounced back into housing and have, been, and have stayed there ever since. With no services, no nothing, and these were families that did not pass sobriety, that had mental health issues, that weren't necessarily fully employed, and on and on and on. Now, again, that is not the ideal way to do something. And I'm not advocating, and I'm not anti-services. What I'm saying is we want to talk about housing first. The magic is in the housing. Something happens there that's unique. Well, then the third thing that we worry about was, why should I do this? This is expensive, right? 
I mean, think about it. I mean, rent's expensive here. Building housing is expensive. That's all we hear. And it is. But here's the thing. <clears throat> here's the thing. It actually costs us more to do nothing than to pay for someone's rent for the rest of their lives. Let me say that again. It would cost me more to walk past and ignore a homeless person than actually pay 100% of their rent for the rest of their lives. How do we know this? Where does the cost come from? Well, it was one of the reasons why we have a medical clinic. What do the homeless use? They'll use emergency rooms for shelter to get out. That costs a lot of money. They'll become more sick because they're more vulnerable. They're more exposed. That costs us a lot of money. They engage police departments, paramedics. That costs us a lot of money. There are at least a dozen, dozen studies that I could cite for you that verify that the cost of doing nothing, when you add it all up, what it really costs us is more than just taking care of the problem. It's more than just taking care of the problem. <clears throat> Two nights ago, in a, new, in a city that we're going to be, we're going to start some work in out of, out of Orange County, there was um, a young family, a Latino family, that uh, was squatting in an abandoned building. And it was a man and it was a woman. Uh, she was pregnant and they had a six-year-old and a two-year-old. And the mom went into labor, right? So the dad panics, gets her, takes her to the emergency room, takes her to the hospital because she's delivering this baby. Leaves his six-year-old and two-year-old behind because he's working this out. You can check this out too, it's in the papers. When he came back, the building had burned down, it was burning. He went in to save his two kids. The, two, the six-year-old, the two-year-old, and the father all died of smoke inhalation. This was two nights ago. I got the call from this, the city we're working in on this. The mom was delivering her baby, had no idea that her husband died or that her two, 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 two children had died. We speculate that the fire was started because it's either a propane fire because they were using that for heat and cooking or he had sort of uh, um, gotten into, done some rewiring and, and you know, broke into some ele an electrical outlet in another building and, and there was a spark there. People die because we don't care of this problem. But here is what's a little bit sad to me. After almost 30 years of doing this, nobody really cares. Nobody really cares. I attended four funerals of people in Costa Mesa who died last year. Nobody cares. Politicians don't care. Councils don't care, right? Most of the folks that are, that are, that are involved in, in, in the churches that even support groups like mine generally don't care. At least not to the point where we're willing to really do something about it. But I'm not asking you, I'm not asking anybody to be a, a hero, right? I'm not asking anybody to do anything extreme. I want you to be selfish. I want you to make a business decision. If you're not moved by just the raw humanity of the need out there, and I'm not sure the evidence shows that most of us do, at least be moved by self-interest. Because if we end homelessness, it will make you money. It will elevate your property values, it will improve your businesses, and it will save you on money that you're spending on your social services. If you're not going to do it because people are dying out on the streets, at least do it because it's a smart business decision. So, what do we conclude from all of this? Why do I, why am I so hopeful? Because I want to tell you, we have to stop talking about managing homelessness. We have to start talking about ending homelessness. I come from a faith tradition where we have a word for homelessness. It's called sin. That we allow this to exist in my faith tradition is called sin. But if that doesn't move you, let your pocketbooks be moved. Because the numbers are coming down. We know how to end it. We know the strategies. We know people don't need to be perfect. And we know it's in our self-interest to do. I want to thank you for being here tonight. I want to thank you, especially the young kids out there, 
for making this kind of commitment. I'm hopeful by the time that you graduate college, there will be no need for a night, night, night like this. Because if we make the right decisions here in Orange County, homelessness can be ended in about five years. We just need to fund the right people, doing the right things, and be disciplined about it. I am appreciative that you're here. I think SOS is one of those foundational organizations. It's sort of the, it, 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 it's sort of the roots of so much of what we do. It's the original nonprofit, if you will, that serves poor people in Orange County. All of us come from this tree. I'd ask you to give. I'd ask you to participate, give what you can to support SOS. And in about five years, let's get together again and have a toast because we've ended this sin once and for all. Thank you so much. I just want to thank SOS for what they gave me, my health, food, and helping everybody else. They've done a lot for the homeless because they need help. They all need a roof over their heads, a place to go, get out of the cold. That's it. Um, but anyway, so I, I just want to let over 250 arrests, you know, for this, this, this man who's 30, 30, please, who's, who's 47 years old, you know, and, and, and he's a, kind of an icon in Costa Mesa. And, and yes, he does give back as he receives. He, he, he's one of those guys that, and I know that the homeless sometimes tend to give a bad name for themselves because they, they tend to, they've kind of given up. Um, um, it's a self-respect issue, but after a, a stint in prison, a little bit of time in prison, his hair used to be down to here and went to prison, shaved his head, who knows why he did that, but <clears throat> got out and, and has been clean and sober, on this, living on the streets for nine years, and, um, it, and Jimmy and I met, he, he, I think you were just probably four months clean and sober when we met, and I was home, you know, homeless at the, at the time, and as a matter of fact, Jimmy's my ex-husband, and so... Yeah, I say that with pride. I, five years ago, not so much. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, 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 and, and I, I have to agree with what, what you said because homelessness is, is um, I, I can appreciate all this. Believe me, I appreciated all the services. I did. I appreciated everything that everybody did for I mean, we used to do the homeless counts, you know. We used to, um, um, and yes, the, when the numbers come in at five or five, that, that, that's like the home, the soup kitchen feeding the, a lot of needy people, and, and that's not necessarily homeless people. So the, the numbers are, and unfortunately some of that might be due to, to deaths that are happening or, or people moving on, but, but it, I, I think that you're right when you say if you, if you take somebody out of a situation and put them in a positive situation to where it's, it's not fight or flight all the time, I, I think people generally in their hearts, I, I'm a Christian, I, and I try to believe that people in their hearts really want to do the right thing. And I'm a dysfunctional knucklehead. I mean, I have three college degrees. I've raised my kids. I'm going to be 63 December 1st, and I'm still a dysfunctional knucklehead. But, and I ended up one day I was homeless, and the next day I was homeless. And, and and that's it. And and there's some people here that know that that and 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 it's so much easier to become homeless than it is to become unhomeless, because once you're homeless, your day is spent surviving being homeless. <clears throat> and so, housing is very important. And I think you're. I think overall, and I've been to the counseling, the council meeting. I've been counseling. Well, that too. But I've been to the council meetings. I've been to. You know, you know, I ran the lighthouse for three years. I, 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 I mean, I get it, and and um, I, I just think there's got to be a different way. I hear about the services, and I hear about all these. Well, these laws were in place seven years ago, but they're introducing them like there was something new that they just came up with. You know, or money being spent for. Uh, silly, to me, they seem like silly things. You know, I, I mean, there just has to be more. And these are human beings. These are these are people. I still today, you know, last Christmas. I mean, and, I'm, and this is not one of these things, but. Last Christmas, my husband and I, sorry, had a f <laughs> had a fight, and you know what I did? And he left, and I opened my house and just let a bunch of homeless people stay. I mean, I, I didn't have anything to cook. I mean, I made macaroni and cheese and peas, and take showers and watch movies, just because nobody should be alone on the holidays. And it didn't matter if they were drinking. It didn't matter if they were, you know. I mean, I know some of the nuttier ones, so I, you know, I wasn't about to put myself in danger. But, but, but I think that you're right. I think if if you put people on the right path, 
and, and I'm still struggling. I mean, I may not be structurally challenged at the moment, but I'm this close to being structurally challenged at, at any moment. And, and that scares me a little bit because you get complacent. You get, you get used to, to, you heard where the people heard. You know, you, you see all the homeless, they move in a herd. It's like, oh, the feed must be over here. Or the, you know, something must be over there. And, and then there's rainy nights and there's where you sleep. And tonight I can appreciate the people staying here. I'm not staying because I've, I've, I've been there, done that too many times. <laughs> I'll tell you the cardboard thing is a, I have this I have this futon at home that's got a lump in it. I told my roommate and she works for them. You know I'm going to get a piece of cardboard because I'm not going to level that thing right out. And sure enough, and I learned that from being homeless. So, and I can appreciate you guys, but there's really more to it than sleeping in a, in a place you're allowed to sleep, because a lot of places you're not allowed to sleep. And I'm going to tell you right now, if anybody's got it nailed, this one right here will tell you <laughs> there's no place that has got it nailed. But again, moving from, and he's a hard worker too. He, he doesn't refuse work. He doesn't, you know, he's really all hard, except he doesn't have a roof over his head. And, and, and he doesn't have, you know, he just, he doesn't, nobody's opened that door for him and, and, and given him an opportunity to, to prove himself as, you know, everybody just assumes, you know, the, well, kind of by the way you look, you may want to clean that up a little bit. By the way, it looks at like maybe he's, you know, a drug addicted. This man's been clean on his, on the streets with no pro nine, for nine, over nine years, just all by himself, and, and hasn't touched a drop, and, and it doesn't even care to, you know. That's amazing to me. And there's a lot of people out there that have the most interesting stories. They have the most, you know. They're just well. Anyways, I'm I'm done. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kathy Clinkenbeard. Again, that's Clinkenbeard, and that's about as animated as I'll get because I'm nervous. <laughs> Um, this is a very emotional topic for me. Um, I was formerly homeless. I've been homeless twice, and I had very different experiences with it. Um, I'm from Orange County. I grew up here, and then when I was in my early 30s, I moved up to Sacramento, and that was where I actually became homeless the first time. And that time, I stayed for one week in a motel and then was directly put into a shelter and at that shelter, um, it was a women's shelter, they determined whether people had mental health issues or whether they had substance abuse issues. And at that point, they sent them from the shelter that we shared to off to our different places. So we got different labels. And that's where I get emotional about it. Um, I was told I have five to ten minutes to talk to you guys, and I hate boring speakers. So what I did to make it go a little quicker is I wrote notes. Um, I want to make five points. So I need my reading glasses to do that. I'm going to tell you, number one, how I became homeless this time, the second time around. Um, number two, how SOS helped me. Number three, how I got off the streets and became housed. Four, the role that mental illness plays. I feel like I get to be the poster child for mental illness tonight. Um, and the importance of faith, hope, and love. Um, those things I got here. Okay. I wrote notes so if I got scared I could read the notes, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> I have to realize I'm preaching to the saved, to everybody that's here, because you guys are here because you care. Um, both of my parents passed away, and I have two brothers who refused to move out of their house um, to sell it after they died. So basically, I sued them. <laughs> and during that process of the lawsuit, it was a big two-story house, and there were three of us that could not get along. And they wouldn't leave, um, so the only thing I had left um, was the will that my parents created. It was a living trust and um, the savings that I had to fight them in court. Um, the legal fees just kept climbing and climbing, and I was unable to work due to my own mental illness issues. And so um, selling the house was the only way that I'd be able to supplement my own um, survival, basically. So... Um, what happened was, is while I was paying attorney's fees, lots of attorney's fees, um, I ended up homeless for a total of three years and was recently um, housed. Um, although in my case, it's very different than Jimmy because what I did was, out of those three years, I only spent four months physically sleeping on the streets. 
Um, the rest of the time, what I did was I, I took notes here for myself of where I stayed. Um, altogether, I slept at 11 different locations over the three years, um, most of which was here in Costa Mesa, 98% of it. Um, I counted four motels, three shelters, on the cement outside of the Costa Mesa Senior Center, um, on the cement outside of the Costa Mesa DMV, and at Triangle Square, which probably most people here know about. <laughs> um, Eventually, after that three-year period, I ended up moving into um, a studio apartment in Costa Mesa. Um, it's an apartment building that was a former travel lodge motel that was converted into an SRO, which stands for Single Room Occupancy Units, or basically studio apartments. And that's where I'm living now. So that was number one, how I became homeless. Moving on. How SOS helped me. Um, one of the first things they did for me was I developed severe allergies while I was staying in the motels. I was staying in a really dirty motel, the Costa Mesa Motor Inn, and some of you know about the health hazards and all of the fines they've received. And what happened was is I ended up needing, none of the over-the-counter medicine was working, and I ended up needing um, a type of medication that was around $125 per bottle for it. And SOS here provided that for free. And it affected my ability to breathe. I didn't think I was going to cry over allergy medicine. <laughs> um, anyway, there's so much more that SOS has done for me. Um, they provided dental exam and x-rays for me. They provided a general physical, which was really important because of all the um, health what, compromised health situations, <laughs> I don't know, that I was in. Um, and some of the funky motels I stayed at were just like um, petri dishes of disease. Anyway, um, and then a gynecological exam and a pap smear. Um, I was able to receive counseling with a master's level therapist. Um, I was able to receive examinations and treatment for two injuries, one of which was a... Um, both were on my big toes. One was uh, an injury that I don't even know exactly how it happened, and it's still healing. Um, and the other one was, um, what was it? It was fungus on a, on a toe that was taking over the entire nail, and I'd never experienced, experienced anything like that. Um, they gave me sunblock. If you notice, I'm Irish and German, and I constantly needed sunblock. When you're homeless, you don't have protection. Um, during the course of the lawsuit, I slowly lost everything. I lost my car first. I always thought if things went bad, I could sleep in the car. The car had problems, and that had to go first. Then I lost the apartment, and then I was outside all the time during the day, so the sunblock was absolutely essential. If anyone's thinking of donating anything, donate lots of sunblock. Um, and then um, daily food bags or weekly, depending on my situation. Um, when I was sleeping outside, um, I received the, the bags every day, and it would be enough for, uh, to be full for the whole day, and I eat a lot. <laughs> and then um, also on a weekly basis if I was staying in a motel. And also there's something I want to talk about that's really important to me, and it's going to make me cry. I'm sure it is. Um, one of the things that I had to deal with that perhaps Jimmy did not have to deal with because he had so much experience in this area was um, coming here, everyone that comes to SOS, as far as I know, they all present ID when they come here, some form of identification. And since I didn't have the street experience or background that someone like Jimmy has, I had to find a way to figure out who it was okay to be around and who it wasn't. So there's a lot of people that are very adept at scamming others that are vulnerable. There are people that do all kinds of unscrupulous things on the street, and some of it's really ugly. So one of the ways that I, I decided who to hang out around and who not to was I, I watched who it was that I ran into here. Because here you have to present identification. Out on the street, there's people that are so off the grid and so, um, so into hiding that they either do not get identification or they don't present it to anyone. And a lot of those people are the ones that are engaging in criminal activities or they're running from criminal activities they've already participated in. So this place became a safe spot for me. Um, the people that I ran into around here were better behaved and more respectful than the ones that refused to participate in anything or show any kind of ID. 
And I'm not talking about the ones that just don't have it and need it, because another gift that I believe they provide here is giving people money to obtain identification. It's really important to have a name. Okay. Um, like I wrote here, this helped me enormously because I was able to figure out who may have something to hide or possibly running from something or someone. Um, the kindness and the professionalism of the staff and the volunteers at SOS help my self-image and my self-esteem. Um, so those are some of the ways that SOS has helped me. The way that they treat people, um, this is the most professional organization that I've run into um, while I've been having to deal with day-to-day -day stuff. This is kind of like coming home to mom and dad. Um, huh? Yeah, it is. It's, it's a family environment here, and I feel it even though I don't know the people personally. Um, how I personally got off the streets was um, in part by following through on the lawsuit against my two brothers, which <laughs> it doesn't sound pleasant, but um, it was something I had to do for myself. And I, I gained a voice in court. That's one thing about courtrooms is they let everybody have their say. And um, that helped to increase my self-esteem as well. And then I slowly started to trust people who wanted to help me and offer suggestions along the way. And um, after fighting for five years um, and three years of homelessness, I eventually managed to have the family home sold and have the profits from the sale divided between all three of us. And then now I want to talk about the role that mental illness plays. Um, this part's the part that's the most vulnerable for me, is um, any form of mental illness can cause a reduction in functioning during times of stress. Um, the ability to think is impacted. The ability to problem solve may be impacted. Um, depression sets in and under stressful circumstances can advance into more complicated illnesses. Depression by itself is a hard thing to deal with. In my own case, um, a lot of what I experienced was very scary for me, and I shut down my feelings in order to deal with the situation. And now that I'm out of the situation, um, I've been diagnosed with PTSD, um, which stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. There was someone earlier that asked me what it meant. And basically what that means for me is I have a lot of um, feelings inside that I didn't get to express on the streets because it's not a good idea to <laughs> be really emotional out there dealing with all types of different people that could eventually harm you. So um, sometimes it's hard to know though what came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, I had I suffered with mental illness um, since, since my adolescence really. Um, there's about five major mental illnesses that I can think of that um, are perhaps rare in the general community, but in the homeless community, I've witnessed a lot of it. The five ones that I think of are major depression, where people have just given up on themselves and the world. Um, that'd be number one. Number two is anxiety disorders, um, like PTSD or panic attacks or OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder. Number three is schizophrenia. Um, the onset is in the late teens to early 20s, even up to the early 30s, and schizophrenia is an example of a thought disorder. Um, people see things that aren't there, they smell things that aren't there, they hear things that are not there. My mom suffered with that. Then number four is bipolar disorder. They've got bipolar one is 1.6% of the population. It's very rare, but on the streets, it's very common. People with bipolar one go really high. They, get the attention of the police, they end up arrested, they use drugs, they do all that, and then when they crash down, you don't see them for months at a time. Again, that's 1.6% of the population. On an even rarer thing is something called bipolar 2 or type 2 bipolar, and that's only 0.5%, a half a percent of the population have that. And the difference between the two is bipolar twos are crippled by very long-lasting depressions, and then they're um, productive when they get hypomanic. So people that have mania go really high up. People that get hypomanic become creative, and so it's hard to figure out that they have the disorder. And that's actually what I'm diagnosed with, and I'm going public with that now, because um, it's really hard to keep secrets and be true to yourself. So. Um, and number five is something called schizoaffective disorder. So the role that mental illness plays is that it's disabling and it affects our ability to think. It is, affects our ability to respond to what we need to take responsibility for in the world. 
Um, it affects our ability to feel our feelings and express them appropriately. It can affect our decision-making skills. Um, number five, schizoaffective disorder, that's a, also 0.5%. It's a half a percent. And um, it's a combination of both schizophrenia and a mood disorder. So imagine you're hallucinating. There's people talking to you. There's people in the room that nobody else sees but you see. Imagine all of that and then imagine your mood going up and down, up and down without your control. It's very difficult to live that way. And the reason I want to be the poster child for mental illness tonight is because um, because of a question, and that's going to make me cry again. <laughs> uh, there was a question asked of me by a therapist at a group therapy session the other day, last week. And what he asked me was, if you wanted people to know one single thing about what it's like to have mental illness, people that don't experience depression, they don't experience highs and lows, they don't hallucinate, um, they're not addicted to drugs or alcohol. What would you want that one thing for people to know? And I came up with two answers, because um, I'm a talker. <laughs> and my two answers are, number one, it's extremely painful. Um, it's extremely painful to suffer illnesses that only 0.5% of the world experience. Um, I've always felt like an outsider, and I've decided that that's not a problem anymore. I just want to be able to educate people. It's just very painful, and then the other thing is it's very isolating. Um, when your moods change a lot, and people don't understand what's going on, it can appear just like flakiness or lack of caring or whatever, but um, a lot of times it's because we're struggling. Okay, I told you I had five things. The last is the importance of faith, hope, and love. Um, I was homeless once before, back in the early 1990s, but never slept outside. My first experience involved shelters up in Sacramento, as I told you. Um, sleeping outside and watching my life spiraling down was really scary. The staff and volunteers at SOS treated me with respect, as I shared before, regardless of how I came in. Um, I came in with a shower and clean clothes sometimes. Other times I just climbed out of a sleeping bag. My hair was dirty, my clothes were wrinkled, and... Um, uh, and I was embarrassed and ashamed. I believe that faith and hope manifest itself in actions. And SOS staff and volunteers show love and kindness, which builds hope in those of us who are down. Um, the longer I was homeless, the more I started to develop a curiosity about how things were going to turn out. And an awareness that God was with me and watching over me. And there's a scripture that I really love. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share that before we end. Um, it's from Deuteronomy 31.8. And um, the reason I want to share this scripture is because people ask me how I got through this. I came from a middle class background. I have a, a bachelor's in psychology. I used to work in the mental health field. And they asked me how I got through this. And what happened was there came a point when I stopped being scared and I started to feel the presence of God. And I know that sounds very religious, <laughs> but it's the truth. And um, the scripture is, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I just want to thank everyone at SO SOS who helped me sustain hope and who demonstrated kindness and compassion towards myself. And I also want to thank them on behalf of all the people that walk through the doors in need, that feel grateful that they can come here and feel supported and feel cared about and to be dealt with uh, with respect. That's something that doesn't happen sometimes on the streets. Sometimes we're looked down upon. Um, sometimes we're treated like we're less than human. And I'm a, uh, what do you call it, a, um, I'm a writer. <laughs> I'm an aspiring writer. I haven't gotten paid to write, but I do write, and they do publish what I, <laughs> they do publish what I write, and um, that's how I think I came to the attention of some of the people here, and um, I forgot what my last thought was, but this place, um, it's bigger than any of us, and these issues of homelessness and mental illness and substance abuse, all of these issues are bigger than anything that any one of us can accomplish on our own. But together, together it's magical. And thank you for listening.
Alexis, why are you out here tonight? And how did you hear about the Share Ourselves organization? Well, I'm actually here for a um, service learning project with Cal State Fullerton. We had a team up with a nonprofit organization, and so we were actually helping with outreach for the event. Um, but the reason why I'm sleeping out here is my main thing is for homeless children and families who really shouldn't be out on the streets. Okay, just a couple questions. Um, so uh, how did you get involved with the SOS? Well, I uh, was retired from photography and I was rattling around doing nothing and so I uh, worked at a soup kitchen on 19th Street and um, I didn't care for that. And I had a friend, Mike McNulty, who was a volunteer here for the last 25 years. And he said, well, why don't you see if SOS can use your services? So I interviewed with uh, Julie Larson and I was uh, picked. I mean, I thought that was really great that I had something to offer to the, my community. And uh, she said, yeah, I think we can use you on the food line. So that's how I started here about five years ago. And I come volunteer one afternoon a week and I uh, hand out groceries. And now they've graduated me to um, doing the tally slips, which is actually very boring, but somebody has to do it, and so I'm willing to do that, just to, just to know that I'm part of and making a contribution. So and then I get the newsletter, and I saw this event, and I said, that sounds like something that would be really interesting, interesting for me, that I would do this for one, e one night, and my life would probably be changed. I would never look at my own bed and my own housing the same way again. So it's kind of exciting. It is, it is quite exciting. What do you think sets this facility apart from all the others uh, in Costa Mesa and Orange County? Well, I think that one of the things the speaker we just heard uh, talked about hope and uh, friendship and uh, compassion. And I think that really is very a very special uh, ambiance here. It, it uh, You have the feeling that we're of service here. We're not here to judge. And that... Uh, that beautiful uh, gift from the heart that is, touches so many people who work here, it just has infected me with that same desire to be of service. And uh, I think that's what makes this organization so special. How do you think the Sleep Out on Superior event will bring about change within the community? Well, I think what it does for me is uh, raises my awareness about what uh, homeless people have to deal with because I have the experience now of having to, just for one tiny second of my life, uh, get a, a real life experience of what it's like to feel a little more vulnerable, to feel a little more uh, anxious about what's going to happen to me tonight. And I'm, I'm here in Southern California, the rain didn't come, it's really a, a very b benign place, but I, my heart goes out to people who are in very rough climates like uh, New York State, now Michigan, where people are homeless and having to deal with that kind of life and death weather. And I think that this is not gonna be that for, for me. I'm gonna be comfortable, I'm gonna be alive tomorrow morning. But I think it does raise my consciousness of the seriousness of, of homelessness in this country and, and what we need to do to address it. So what's bringing you out to the Sleep Out on Superior event tonight? Well, I really believe that charity helps the world, and I'm just here to support homeless people and help them. So is this your, your first time actually sleeping outside? Um, no, I've slept outside a couple times, but not for this. Not like this at all? Yeah. How do you think this is going to change your view on homelessness? Well, I think it's really going to... It's not just going to change my opinion, but once I start doing these things to help charity and like homeless people, that other people should follow in my lead. Our family's been a long supporter of SOS. Our daughter, Katie Santori, works in PR here. I'm in a covenant group uh, through St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, and Will Claddy, one of the board of directors of SOS, is in our group. And uh, we've attended the last couple celebrity chefs' dinners and the taco the big taco events. Uh, I referee football, I officiate football in the NFL, and I've luckily been able to donate a couple of tickets uh, to the Celebrity Chef's Dinner, and uh, so we just think it's a wonderful organization, and uh, what a great cause. That's wonderful. How do you think this event will shed light on the homelessness factor in Costa Mesa and in Orange County as a whole? 
the speeches that were given a few moments ago by Karen, by Larry Haynes, by um, Kathy Clinkenbeard, and by Jimmy were just absolutely moving. And I was one that had all these preconceived notions and opinions based on, not based on fact at all, just kind of what I've heard and kind of what I view and see. So it's uh, really changed my outlook on what the situation is and what we can all do to make it better. So you've said you've changed your outlook a little bit. Where did you come from and where are you now? I came from a real middle class family in Santa Barbara, California, and I taught and coached at Orange Coast College. I've never been homeless, never been close to being homeless. Um, and I, I've always uh, uh, kind of just walked, looked the other way and not paid any attention to it. And I'm not going to look the other way and, and I'm going to pay a lot of attention to it from now on. It's nice to see an evolution. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it makes you feel great inside. You know, when we're little kids at Christmas time and parents say it's better to, to give than receive and kids go, no, no, it's much better to receive at this stage of the game. It's so much better to give and, and let the people that need the help receive. I'm Julie Nea. I'm the volunteer services manager here at SOS and my job is to um, bring on new volunteers to SOS and get them uh, uh, introduced into our agency and to the work we do here. We have about uh, 200 plus weekly volunteers that come through here. They work on our food line, they work in our kitchen, they work at our front desk. Um, they're just here to greet our patients, our clients, um, and those people that are just going through tough times that just need a friendly face. Um, there's a lot of things that we do, the tours that we're able to give to show people around and uh, just all the good work that we do and um, this is just an amazing night I am just overwhelmed by the work that's going on here and the enthusiasm of everyone that's here and um, I'm just anxious to see how long we make it through the night <laughs> I'll be the one sitting up in my sleeping bag <laughs> so. <laughs> thank you hi my name is Christine I'm one of the interns for SOS um, I started working here, or I started about interning about a couple months ago. I think it's just such a great experience. When I come here, I do different things. I'm on the food line, or I'm in the front desk, or I'm shadowing a case manager, or financial process, and they're just, whenever I come here, it's just such a great experience knowing that we're helping people. Um, we're making sure that no one is left leaving here hungry. We're making sure that um, providing them with even different resources just to show them a better path and what they could do to hopefully better their lives and tonight is just such a great amazing night we're packing just different hygiene products or food groceries or anything like that just for in the future when they do come for help anyone with low-income homelessness we're there for them so I'm just really grateful that I'm here helping out um, knowing that we're doing this for a really great cause so yeah.